And when I look at your filmography, you're, for lack of a better term, all over the place. You take on all sorts of different roles. You, you don't, you really tackle them head on. So I guess my question is, what's your process for, for picking your next project? Um, I mean, content, story, um, other people involved, like with the girl from Plainville, I was a big fan of Elle Fanning and I thought that she has, you know, she has very great taste and kind of knew if she was on board as a producer, there must be a certain taste level with everybody else, you know, surrounding her, like Lisa Cholodanko as a director and, you know, our great writers and showrunners. So yeah, I guess I look at story, I look at content, I look at the other people involved. But when you look at what you're doing in season two, The Russian Doll, and you look at what you're doing with Elle in this project, it's night and day. I mean, it's two different sides of the spectrum. Is it hard to go from one project to the next? I mean, that's the joy of acting. That's the thrill of the, of the ride, you know, getting to put on different hats, try different things, work with different people, have different experiences, you know and um, try to honor the people you're working with, honor their passion, their story, their, you know, vision and uh, adapting to that. And I like working in television because you have different directors coming in. So you also then have to adapt to those directors and how they communicate to you. So it kind of keeps you on, on your toes and makes it fun and challenging in a, in a different way than doing, you know, film. But how do you prepare for the content matter you touch on in this project with Elle? Because it's very heavy and your role in particular probably carries a lot of the weight on this narrative. So, I mean, if I had a hat, I'd take it off to you because you, you pulled it off. I mean, I gotta imagine after every day you shot this, you went home completely drained because my word, I mean, how do you prepare for something like this? Well, yeah, working on The Girl from Plainville, I always take my work very seriously, but when you are portraying a real life person and, and a real story, there's, there's an, an added weight and importance, I feel like, to the work that you're doing and, and wanting to get it right and honor them and their emotions. And um, so there's, a, yeah, there's an added pressure. Um, I did a lot of research, you know, reading different articles. Obviously our show is based on Jesse Baron Cohen's article. It was an Esquire, also titled The Girl from Plainville and watched the documentary several times. Lynn had appeared on different talk shows or um, she was on 48 Hours. So I watched that footage over and over. And then uh, my dialect coach had compiled all of her like interviews um, into an audio file that I could listen to every morning. So I had like my no noise canceling headphones on every morning in the trailer. And um, when they were doing my hair, obviously I'd take them off and just play it on my phone. And we all kind of got to know her answers by heart. And I would just kind of, that was my way of tapping into her and um, tapping into her emotions, just like listening to her every morning. It almost became like this mantra. Was there something you did before filming each day that got you into that headspace you needed to be to be able to pull off Lynn? I mean, just listening to her was enough. I mean, um, I think she's very giving in her interviews. Um, that was part of what intrigued me so much about her and playing her was how transparent she was in interviews. And, you know, oftentimes people hold back a little and she wasn't afraid of like even giving a little humor. And, you know, she wanted people to know that her son was multifaceted, you know? And so we didn't want the show to only just be tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. There had to be some levity. And she even gave that in, you know, her brief interviews. So there was that essence of her that I wanted to capture. So yeah, I would listen to her every morning and, um, sometimes watch her and uh, look at photos. And I mean, really it was all there on the page for us, every scene that we were doing. Um, There's a specific thing that we wanted to capture, a specific, you know, aspect to her and her son's relationship or her and her ex-husband's relationship. And, you know, you're going through the five stages of grief. So there was that that we got to ride throughout the whole show, you know, whether it was guilt or pain or forgiveness, what she was kind of going through during each scene. So that was, that made it pretty clear, like a clear intention to tap into in every scene. 
Is there something in your career that you can equate this process to something you've done in your past that kind of matched the same type of preparation, emotional upheaval you might've went through as you were filming this? Because I have my own theory. I'm curious to hear what your answer is. Yeah, I equate it to Boys Don't Cry the most as like, as such a profound experience. And when you are dealing with a tragedy like that and you know, these people are still alive, still grieving what had happened. And and just also like the camaraderie on set and how we all felt together, working together as an ensemble. It, it had a similar feel to Boys Don't Cry. Did you, I'm always curious about this. Did you avoid certain members of the cast when you knew a certain moment was coming in your narrative? No, but I'm not one of those kinds of actors. Of course, we had to avoid everybody because of COVID anyways. We weren't really allowed to congregate. We had to, <laughs> which maybe might have helped us in our preparations, but even at lunch, they wanted us to each eat alone in our trailers. And I'm an actor that I love being on set. I love getting in everybody's business, every department. I'm like, you know, grips, what are you doing? You know, set dressers, what are you doing? I love just like, getting in there and digging in and seeing what people are doing and talking to people. And I love eating lunch with different departments and, you know, um, yeah, so it's, it's been uh, challenging to say the least to have to kind of, you know, adjust to the, to the new COVID protocols and not that, being able to have that kind of socializing. Did that enhance this process for you in terms of what you're able to deliver on screen? Or do you think it might've taken something away? I think it enhanced. It also gave me a lot more time alone in my trailer to just be listening to Lynn, thinking about her working on the script, you know, um, cause I want to say I'm lazy, but <laughs> like I said, I don't like being in my trailer. <laughs> so when I'm in my trailer, I'm like, what else am I going to do but work? So I think it allowed me to kind of do more work. What was the hardest moment in this whole process for you? What was the hardest scene that you knew you had to nail in order to do what you had to do to deliver the story? The hardest scene, there was a moment where like she walks into his bedroom. I think it's in one of the first few episodes and she finds his suicide notes and there's one addressed to his father and one addressed to Michelle and there's not one there addressed to her. And she, is very upset by that. And um, they wanted me to have a big cathartic moment there. And um, I feel like that was challenging just because I didn't want it to be too arch. I wanted it to be still very grounded and, and sometimes that kind of wailing, throwing stuff, hollering stuff can get a, a bit theatrical. And so just like trying to keep it really grounded. Um, I felt intimidated going into it, but when we did it, it actually felt very good. Yeah, you only emotionally shattered me in that moment. So I don't know whether to thank you or to uh, be upset at this moment because you really, that, that I, you would ask me what scene it would have been. It would have been that particular scene because how can you project that type of moment on screen with any amount of authenticity? Well. I wouldn't know how to do it, but you sure as hell pulled it off because you had me believing that you were going through this in, in real time. And I have to think that you had to have reached into some sort of research for, for like the suicide statistics, the hotlines, and read up on those sort of things, and maybe some other mothers to be able to get to that point in order to portray this character. Am I, am I right in that assumption? I mean... <laughs> I lost my father when I was younger, um, 19, and that pain is still very on the surface for me. Okay. And, um, so I don't like to say like I draw from that, but it's very easy to access. And uh, I had a, had a child in May, 2020, and um, this was my first job working away from home, working away from him. He was like a year and a half when we were shooting, not even, and, so just being away from him was was new and, and very hard because we had been in quarantine. We'd all been together. We had the luxury of having a lot of time um, as a unit. And so yeah, all I had to do was like turn on the nanny cam and like hear him. And then like I was shattered. <laughs> 
So I was drawing on that a lot too, just the pain of being away from someone you love. Your, your performance in this takes my breath away. I, I'm just going to put it out there. You, you, you did the story a uh, service. You really just play. You, what, your part is so important to telling the story because the mother's grief really takes it to another level. It's one thing to talk about, you know, the circumstances, but your role, Lynn's part, is really the emotional crux of this whole series. And I am so proud of being able to speak to you and be able to help tell everybody about your work. And hopefully we see you down the road with other award circuit uh, interviews because you've been nominated because you certainly held it. You sure as hell deserve it. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Say hi to your wife. Oh, I will. And hopefully my kids <laughs> didn't destroy the house. Okay. <laughs> Bye now. Bye.